Yes. Notice of motion number 172. And I move Notice of motion number 172. I move the motion in my name and I can indicate that we will be looking to have a, a vote today for this motion. Madam Speaker, fires are burning across the planet in places that they never used to burn and in times of the year where burning never occurred. Uh, places are burning uh, outside of uh, human memory uh, and um, in, in vegetation uh, and situations that is, uh, appears incomprehensible. Right now, uh, communities in Queensland and New South Wales are suffering through severe bushfires and there are still catastrophic bushfires burning uh, in uh, communities uh, in the hinterland and coastal areas and uh, subtropical parts of uh, Queensland and also in northern New South Wales. And uh, on behalf of the Greens, and I, I would say everyone in this parliament, I want to say that our hearts go out to the people in those communities. And we're thinking of the people on the front line, people who are fighting those fires and doing the work, which is so exhausting and uh, frightening, and that Tasmanian communities have experienced in just um, too recent memory. So <coughs> we are thinking of those people today. Madam Speaker, the world's lack of action on climate change and environmental protection and including the inaction of our own federal and uh, state governments is costing us all a very great deal. We are seeing an increase in human lives lost through bushfires um, across countries that have never before had fires and there is uh, also a massive escalation in fire problems in places like California and, and Greece where whole communities um, thousands of houses have burnt down in a single, a single day. Madam Speaker, we're seeing the mass destruction of ecosystems on a scale which has profound consequences for human survival. We are seeing the Arctic countries burning. Uh, we are seeing the Amazon on fire, Madam Speaker. And not only does this have um, place grave threats for uh, communities, indigenous communities in, Amazon, in, in the Amazon that rely on their forests for survival. Uh, it, uh, it places at threat the extinction of animals and plants. And it also is a huge threat to the survival of the human species. If areas which have been previously sinks for carbon dioxide flip over and become sources of carbon dioxide as the increasing drying of the planet and uh, the drying of those environments means that rainforests that once were never burned are now drying and becoming very vulnerable to fire. Unfortunately, what's happening in New South Wales is reflecting parts of that story and we've seen subtropical rainforest areas in, um, in the Dorigo Plateau, for example, the Mount Highland Nature Reserve that's on fire, high altitude rainforests in World Heritage listed places like Mount Highland Reserve. And these areas have remained unchanged for millions of years. We've seen uh, the Binnaburra Lodge, historic lodge in um, Queensland burned to the ground. There's never been fire in living memory in that area. Madam Deputy Speaker, we know that the number of days of very high fire danger are increasing and we know that this is a clear long-term trend that's driven by warming and drying effects of climate change and this is now a very well-established fact verified by the CSIRO, the Bureau of Meteorology and the Bushfire Natural Hazards Cooperative Research Centre including at the global level by many other organisations. So Madam Deputy Speaker, those um, communities in New South Wales and Queensland that are paying a very high price right now uh, are, are, are following the experience that we've had too recently here in Tasmania 
where last summer we all know that 6% of the Tasmanian Wilderness World Heritage Area was lost through burning, including Gondwana land vegetation and uh, plants and animals that have also never previously experienced burning. Um, extreme bushfires which threaten communities in the, the Huon Valley, the Derwent Valley, Central Highlands, uh, the Northwest, where people suffered through months of um, harsh conditions, high anxiety levels, smoke inhalation, which caused um, far greater numbers of people to be admitted to hospital with anxiety and asthma. And of course, following that, there has been substantial spend of resources and um, effort from that community that could otherwise have been spent elsewhere. The honey industry is also on its knees. Uh, the impact on wine growers, I personally know of um, two families in the Huon Valley that have gone out of business, wine growers that have gone out of business as a result of the impact of fires on their crops last year. We, um, we heard from Chris Arnold in the Mercury today about the extreme risk for the East Coast this summer with global heating causing uh, warmer conditions and low rainfall in uh, that uh, part of Tasmania, that beautiful part of Tasmania, which uh, until, um, which only recently had a um, bizarre fire that occurred several months ago at Dolphin Sands. And that fire showed very um, starkly to local communities and to volunteer firefighters and uh, career firefighters that the East Coast has tinderbox dry conditions and it has vegetation which is extremely vulnerable, it seems, to um, unpredictable outbreaks of fire. Greg Mullins wrote a piece in the Sydney Morning Herald yesterday, he said, and uh, Madam Speaker, and he points to these conditions no longer being exceptional. And for people who don't know Greg Mullins, he is a very highly respected former fire and rescue commissioner from New South Wales, who um, has been uh, part of a, um, a group of uh, firefighters, emergency service workers who in the summer, last summer in Australia, came out and um, made a strong plea to the federal government to take action on the climate emergency to recognise that we are in conditions that will increasingly become more threatening for human lives and definitely more threatening for the natural ecosystems on which we depend. Greg Mullen said today, or yesterday, that the conditions we're experiencing are no longer exceptional. Uh, they are the new normal. We have to respond, therefore, on a scale that balances, um, that, that is balanced with the increased risks that we're facing. So, Madam Deputy Speaker, uh, we, we know that there has been a lack of action by the federal and uh, liberal government on climate change. We know that they are fundamentally driven by the interests of the coal and gas, the fossil fuel industry lobby. We know the documented evidence from the United States that in the 1970s and 1980s, Exxon, Chevron, and all the other major oil companies colluded with each other to, uh, to, uh, to knowingly uh, shut down openness and, and information about the impact of burning fossil fuels on increasing greenhouse gas emissions and, and increasing temperatures. They knew that. It's well documented now. Uh, and, and we know that they did what the tobacco industry did. In fact, they employed tobacco industry lobbyists, Madam Speaker, to, uh, to sow seeds of doubt about the certainty around the science, to actively use language like uncertainty, to, um, to throttle the action 
that should have occurred three decades ago at least, which would have made such a difference to where we are today. Uh, that didn't happen, but still, uh, their patsies, the Federal Liberal Party, uh, with the active support, Madam Speaker, of the Federal Labor Party, the patsies of those two, uh, of the uh, oil industry, the coal industry, the gas industry, these are the, uh, the politicians who are putting the future well-being of all people who live in Australia at risk because of their inaction, worse than inaction, their, their purposeful um, supporting of uh, the opening of new mines like the Adani mine that will uh, threaten... Yeah, climate criminals. That's right, Ms O'Connor. Climate criminals. Uh, John Hewson today uh, in has called the former Liberal leader, John Hewson, uh, has uh, reported in the Guardian Australia just, uh, just a short time ago, Madam Speaker. John Hewson has called on Scott Mor Morrison to grant government MPs a conscience vote on a new parliamentary motion declaring a climate emergency. Uh, he wants MPs to champion the new parliamentary motion, which is being pursued by the Australian Greens and is supported by most of the lower house crossbench. Uh, he wanted to uh, allow Scott Morrison to allow a conscience vote because he said Liberal backbenchers were feeling the pressure from their constituents about the coalition's lack of ambition on climate change. Well, so they should be, Madam Speaker. <coughs> so they should be, uh, because that just indicates the effectiveness of the young people who have coordinated amongst themselves and on our behalf started the pressure on governments to recognise that we are in a climate emergency. And those young people and the massive school strikes for climate strikes which have occurred around the country have been a catalyst for change. And thank goodness they are forcing the adults in Australia to stand up and, and get out of our complacency and stop pretending that incremental business as usual change is what's needed to respond to such an urgent, urgent crisis that the whole of uh, humanity faces, including Australians and every single person in Tasmania. Uh, that momentum has uh, shifted now, as it, as it ought to, from putting the responsibility on children to all of us adults. And so the next school strike for climate will be a global strike for climate. It will be adults and children. It will be, I hope, Mr Broad and Ms Standen, uh, Mr Tucker, Ms Courtney and Ms Ryla, Mr Shelton and all the other MPs who happen to be in the room today. I hope that all of you will be there supporting children to show them that it's not children who need to lead, but it is uh, people in government need to lead and we need to declare a climate emergency. So, Madam Speaker, uh, our brave firefighters will face off against the flames next summer or, um, you know, in the next few weeks, whenever that time will come. No matter what, no matter what we do, they will be there, but they need a lot more help uh, they need uh, a lot more help in the form of deliberate action on climate, uh, on climate emergency to slow down the rate of heating. And that is something that the Greens will be returning to discuss in this parliament. But that is not why this motion has been brought before us today. It is essential, it is part of it, but that is not the principal subject of today's motion. The purpose of today's motion, Madam Speaker, is to identify what we need immediately for the upcoming uh, summer bushfire season, or shall I say, the, for, for the upcoming bushfire period. Because we have to uh, understand that despite the uh, small amount of rain that occurred, uh, well, small or large in some parts of the state, it was not enough to get the East Coast out of a high bushfire risk. Chris Arnold has confirmed that. Uh, in his uh, piece in the Mercury. We are not out of the woods for East Coast residents. 
uh, and we cannot assume that we will be out of the woods for people living in other parts of Tasmania either. We know all too well that uh, rain at this time of the year can cause a flush of growth, which can end up being um, a highly uh, threatening form of vegetation when the, when the summer gets hot. So, Madam Speaker, what we need is more funding for support to develop community and individual fire protection plans. It is so important that every person in Tasmania knows what to do when a bushfire comes, that they know how to protect themselves, they know where to go, they know who to call on, they know what to do with their animals, they know whether to stay in their house or whether to leave their house, what to do if the wind changes and they don't get out in time. These are essential things. We need to have uh, more funding for specialist equipment like large firefighting equipment at the federal level uh, and at the state level. And we have to stop the cuts that are affecting the firefighting capability of Parks and Wildlife Service, the ongoing long-term cuts that have um, crippled our remote area team capacity, that have uh, taken away the expertise that we used to have in remote firefighting. And we have to have the money available for proper uh, fuel reduction burns so that they can be done safely in a timely fashion and uh, do what we can to protect um, Gondwan and veg vegetation, uh, communities, buildings and people. So, Madam Speaker, there are three reports that are sitting on the emergency service minister, uh, the emergency services minister's desk, gathering dust, gathering dust exactly, uh, that have to be actioned and have to be resources resourced. And it is deeply concerning that here we are um, at the end of September, and um, despite the. Um, the minister making a, a great statement to parliament a couple of months ago in response to the um, Australasian Fire and Emergency Service Authority Council report on the uh, summer bushfires this year. Despite that, uh, we have not heard anything further and that is why we're here today, Madam Speaker. We're here to shine a light on the Minister's uh, apparent inaction, and I look forward to him getting up and uh, correcting the record, and perhaps I'm wrong. I hope I am wrong. Because, Madam Speaker, all the Minister did uh, when that report was tabled, and I haven't heard a peep about, uh, out of him since then, all he did was accept the recommendations in principle. Now, Madam Speaker, an in principle support is not the same as doing something about it. And I really hope that the Minister's going to get up here and say that he's actually supporting all of the recommendations, because uh, what we had was this uh, massive review of the management of the Tasmanian fires of December 2018 to March 2019. That uh, was prepared by uh, some uh, awesome specialists. And it, from that review, are nine actions, nine recommendations. It, uh, re it confirmed, that report confirmed that the summer bushfires that we suffered last uh, summer were the second largest only to the 1967 bushfires, that they occurred during the second warmest summer on record in Tasmania, including with massive uh, fuel loads, that the three main fires were started by lightning strikes uh, at Jill River on the 27th of uh, December at the Great Pine Tier in the Central Plateau and Raveau Road in Huon Valley uh, on the 15th of January. Uh, that the fires burned through 210,000 hectares of Tasmanian land and uh, 2,300 hectares of threatened vegetation communities in the Tasmanian Wilderness World Heritage Area, as well as a total of 6% of the Wilderness World Heritage Area, including endemic conifers like the King Billy Pine and the Pencil Pine. 
and that 14% of our tall forests were burned. And the review found, Madam Speaker, that fire crews were not properly resourced and they were without the, the aircraft that they, uh, that they needed to identify hotspots. Madam Speaker, that is a, a damning finding. Um, the minister effectively tried to bury it in um, a, an immensely long ministerial statement that hid uh, the truth that uh, people knew, people who had been around for long enough, not very long, Madam Speaker, all in the term of this government. Like, this is, there is no opportunity here uh, for, for this minister, for this government, to, uh, to kick the can back into the past of previous governments, because we've had now three, three important pieces of work on what needs to be done to properly uh, respond to the threat of bushfires in Tasmania and to prepare us for future threats. Dr Tony Press uh, wrote the Tasmanian Wilderness World Heritage Area Bushfire and Climate Change Research Report in December 2016. And uh, there are outstanding recommendations from that report. In July 2017, uh, Simon Pilkington and Alex Dean uh, wrote a, a very important paper, uh, briefing paper, Fire Crews, entitled Fire Crews Evolving the TFS Wildfire Capability for uh, the Tasmanian Fire Service. Uh, we have the AFAC review, as, as it's been so called, which was produced this year. But we also have, Madam Deputy Speaker, a really um, important uh, work submissions from the United Firefighters Union of Australia Tasmania branch. And they have done a number of submissions uh, to each of the reviews that have occurred, the Tony Press review um, and uh, to the AFAC review, they made a uh, submission. But on the back of the submission that they made, which had not been acted upon, by previous emergency services minister, Michael Ferguson. On the back of that, they also wrote um, a really clear letter uh, signed by Lee Hills, the vice president and senior industrial officer of the UFUA. They wrote a letter uh, about the Tasmanian wildfires on the 8th of January and pointed to uh, a proposal that they had um, provided the government with in 2017 to deal with initial attacks of wildfire response capability in remote areas. The basis of that proposal being uh, remote access teams that, ha that were to be pre-identified and that would hit fires early. They said in the letter that they uh, in September 2018, the UFU and our members desperately attempted to have a trial of this proposal in place for the 2018-2019 fire seasons. Um, they offered uh, compromises and an MOU to alleviate any concerns that uh, TFS management might have had. But TFS failed, they said, to have the trial in place by the start of the fire season. If only they had been listened to, Madam Speaker. If only we had that additional capacity, because that is exactly what the AFAC review found. The AFAC review found that crews in Tasmania were not properly resourced and they did not have the aircraft they needed to identify hotspots. And as a consequence, the Gel River fire, which started on December the 27th, was not picked up as continuing and was not acted on in a timely fashion. And uh, so uh, what we saw as a result of that was a massive spread of that fire and um, a huge separation of resource en energy from, um, from the Revo River, from the Revo Road fire um, and in the Gel River area. And so uh, that was an enormous stress for people who were involved in, um, in the splitting of resources, uh, the sharing of resources. And these are things which, of course, we rise to a challenge. 
And again, I want to thank all the people involved in uh, working through that fire period. It was uh, hugely tiring and traumatic for some of the people involved, but tiring for everyone involved. And people did their best. But people, uh, we need governments that provide people with the tools so that they can do their best um, and do better. And Madam Speaker, when we had people who were working for those on the front line who asked for the tools so that they could do better, and those tools were not provided, they got, um, they, 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 there was no resources forthcoming. Uh, that is, frankly, um, disgraceful. And it is deeply concerning that we've got a summer coming where we know there is a much higher risk of, of fires than there has been. Uh, we know there's a risk there now on the East Coast already. And so what we want to do is hear from the Minister about his actual support or not for the recommendations from the AFAC report and from the Tony Press report. And we want to hear what resources he's going to put in this summer, because the budget that we passed uh, in budget estimates, that we scrutinised in budget estimates, was totally deficient in resources to respond to the AFAC review. I mean, incredible. The Treasurer is, is cutting 0.07% from every single government department, and we've yet to hear where the cuts are going to come from in the fire service, because they're certainly coming from hospitals, they're certainly, they're certainly coming from frontline nurses and they're certainly coming uh, from people who need um, elective surgeries. They're being cut. So where are the cuts coming from in, in the um, police, fire and emergency services area? Where are they coming from? I'd like to hear from the minister about that. Yeah. Is that why there's no money in the budget? Like, where is the commitment to funding the, um, the recommendations from the APAC re review, because they don't come for nothing. There's certainly some things in here um, that involve discussions. Recommendation one, that the, the TFS, PWS and uh, Forestry Tasmania initiate a discussion among the Australasian peers about good practice around managing new fire starts in remote terrain. Can we please get an update from the Minister about how that's going? The second re recommendation from AFAC, that TFS should pursue the creation of a cadre of volunteer remote area firefighters. Will that be done by this summer? Uh, have they been created? Uh, and where are the re what resourcing has been put into that cadre of remote area firefighters? How many will there be? Where will they be deployed? The third recommendation, the TFS should initiate a policy review to clearly identify what body or agency is responsible for planning, carrying out and enforcing fuel management on private property <coughs> at a township level. Crucial, Madam Deputy Speaker, Madam Speaker, crucial. Because uh, this is exactly the issue that we're confronting, where people need to do um, fuel management on private properties, uh, and it is incredibly important that they get the support not just at the start when they're getting a permit or they're getting somebody, a volunteer, to come and look over their property, but there's no process, at least not that I'm aware of, of, of having those fires checked at the end to make sure they've been properly extinguished. And this is where we see time and again through people uh, doing their best and believing a fire to be out, and I've personally experienced this myself, uh, we have a property down east outside of Signet. I have personally experienced um, getting the permit, lighting the fire, doing the burn off, uh, doing the back burn, uh, the, the um, using the blade on the tractor to make sure that uh, keep to keep uh, making sure that the fire is not spread. It, it being extinguished and raining on it for six days, light rain, the perfect conditions for burn off and then um, just seeing it be rekindled in the night when a wind came up. I could see Mr Tucker's smiling. Yes, it is concerning and it was very concerning. Not surprising, we were aware that that was a risk, but how many other people are not aware of that risk? So support and training 
uh, the resourcing for uh, volunteers who um, come and check on the, um, the fuel management on private properties at, at a township level. The fourth recommendation, that TFS, PWS and Forestry Tasmania work with government and each other to continue to pursue a whole estate fuel management and burning program that encompasses all land tenures. Well, I'd be interested to hear um, from the Minister where that is up to. That TFS, PWS and Forestry Tasmania agree to an updated version of interagency fire management protocol. Has that been completed? Will that be conducted well in advance of the, uh, of, you know, November? And um, what opportunity is there for, um, for uh, volunteers uh, involved in those organisations to be engaged in that process? Recommendation six, that TFS, PWS and Forestry Tasmania established a state air desk to be staffed by specialist staff year round. Uh, number seven, that TFS, PWS and Forestry Tasmania jointly reach a decision on whether a winch capable remote area of firefighting <coughs> capability should be maintained in Tasmania. Has that been decided upon? And uh, what is the funding for it? Um, if it's not going to be used, then where are we going to get that capability from? If it's not, if we're not going to have it in Tasmania, how are we going to have it available uh, when we need it? And clearly, um, that's something that was lacking in the 2018-19 summer fire, the ability to get people into remote areas in a timely fashion. Uh, recommendation eight, that the organisation should jointly carry out work to identify acceptable shift lengths and patterns for all personnel working on emergency operations. And number nine, that TFS engage in discussions with government about the construction of a purpose-built state control centre facilities for emergency management in Tasmania. And that is because, Madam Speaker, uh, the AFAC clearly named up the inadequacies, the woeful inadequacies of the current state control centre. And uh, that's something that clearly has to be fixed uh, before, before um, the next bushfire, large bushfire. So it, it's crystal clear um, uh, that the, the crews that were attending the uh, Gel River fire in the southwest last summer were not properly resourced, um, that there wasn't aircraft available to identify the hotspots, and that frontline fire crews withdrew too early as a consequence. Uh, issues, uh, the communication issues were identified between Parks and Wildlife and the fire service, and uh, resources were delayed from parks. So, Madam Speaker, uh, I want to wind up shortly and give some time for to hear the Minister's response because I think it's really important for all Tasmanians to understand that we have a government, that we have a minister, which has listened to these successive re reviews, that is taking it seriously, that is going to put the support in that our volunteer and uh, paid uh, fire fighters need uh, so that we can be confident uh, that we have the tools, the best tools at hand possible, that we are as well prepared as we can be, that people understand how to respond when the next bushfire comes. Uh, because we know that there will be more dry lightning sti strikes, <coughs> even though we haven't had these before in Tasmania. These are the weather patterns that we must come to expect as being the new normal. Um, our landscapes are already exceptionally dry, and there is another long, hot summer on the way. So I want to hear from the Minister how he's reprioritised the budget and how he's uh, found the money to put into this resourcing so that the welfare of Tasmanians is not at risk this summer and uh, that we keep our natural ecosystems intact.